Diamond, uh, it's been a long time since I've been uh, director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law, but I am the Mossbacher uh, Senior Fellow in Global Democracy at CDDRL and the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. And most importantly, I am um, a very longtime friend of the distinguished scholar who was born exactly to the day, two years after me. <laughs> and so uh, Professor Jima Bwadi and I uh, share many bonds most of all, I'd say a common commitment to the study and advancement of democracy. But if you ever wanna win a trivia contest, um, you can throw that in there as well. I think uh, that if scholars of uh, African uh, democracy, politics, governance and development were polled uh, uh, in Europe, the United States, Sub-Saharan Africa, and elsewhere, and asked, who is the most important and influential political scientist of and in Africa? Uh, the answer that they would most uh, frequently uh, give uh, would be the person who has been selected to give this year's S.T. Lee lecture, namely Professor Jima Bwadi. Jima is not only a trailblazer in the study of governance, politics, uh, democracy, and public opinion uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and a longtime board member of and contributor to the Journal of Democracy and many other enterprises. He's been a very influential uh, civil society leader in Ghana and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'd say one of the most important intellectual change makers in Africa. He's the co-founder and now chair of the board of the Afro Barometer, which of all the regional barometers regu uh, measuring regularly or periodically attitudes and values toward democracy in different regions of the world is the most impactful uh, and the most highly respected and the most influential, I think, of any of them. Jim had told me the other day that the Afrobarometer now has its ninth wave in the field across Sub-Saharan Africa, ultimately uh, to engage, as it has been in recent years, more than three dozen African countries. It's become a global reference point for data on African democracy, governance, quality of life, um, human well-being uh, that is increasingly used by policymakers, donors, and of course, scholars like ourselves to understand um, both uh, how Africans are experiencing governance and development and what their attitudes, values, and aspirations are. Uh, even before that, uh, Jima co-founded and served, I believe, for some two decades or so as executive director of the single, again, I, I would venture to say, most uh, highly respected uh, think tank in Africa devoted to the study of democracy and governance, the Ghana Center for uh, Democratic Development. He also taught for some three decades in the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana, and he's held faculty positions at several universities in the U.S., including American University School of International Service, as well as fellowships at many distinguished institutions, including the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, the International Forum for Democratic uh, Scott, uh, for Democratic Studies at the National Endowment for Democracy, and not least, the Center for Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law uh, here at Stanford. Uh, he has California roots in that. Uh, he got his PhD from UC Davis, uh, and he has also been a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and uh, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, his uh, Numerous works 
on governance and public opinion, democracy, human rights, uh, and uh, democratic attitudes and values in Africa have been uh, uh, acknowledged with many awards, including the Distinguished Africanist of the Year Award of the African Studies Association, the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Peace and Social Justice, and one of uh, the Republic of Ghana's highest honors, the Order of Volta. We don't have an Order of Volta to bestow on you, Jima, but we do have the S.T. Lee Lecture, and it's our honor to have you giving it this year. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jima. Thank you, Larry, for a most warm welcome, and uh, of course, the obviously inflated uh, introduction of me. Uh, thank you, FSI and uh, CDDRL for this honor to be the F F F F ST Lee, uh, to give the ST Lee lecture uh, for this year. Uh, my topic is uh, just to scare you, but it was mainly to int interest you in coming to this forum. So if uh, the, I don't live up to the billing, it was merely an advertising plot. And that is um, anarchy foretold, um, the democratic backsliding in West Africa and of course its implications for uh, the region's near future and, uh, and medium term future. So this is how I begin. On Sunday, September 5 last year, a military officer came on air in, on the, on, in, in Guinea to broadcast that the country's president, Alpha Conde, had been arrested and the constitution dissolved. Coup leader Kenneth Mamadi Dumbuya, then a 41-year-old Special Forces officer and a former French legionnaire, said he and his fellow soldiers were fulfilling their duty, quote unquote, to save the country. Even before that broadcast, his photo had been circulating on social media, and it shows the ousted president slouching on a couch surrounded by his captors, a photo that was half proof of life and half proof of overthrow. The announcement and scene, of course, were uncomfortably reminiscent of what had been thought to be a bygone era in West Africa. Mm -hmm. But what was new? The photo went viral instantly, becoming a meme as young Guineans embarked on a challenge as the social media lingo goes to replicate the scene. Humorous memes aside, by all anecdotal indications, this coup was well received. But more troubling than the photo or the apparent pop popularity of the coup is that coups themselves seem to be going viral in our region again. So although there were three, only a handful, rather, a handful of coup attempts over the previous two decade and a half and a half in West Africa, and the last successful one had been as long ago as 2012 in Mali, West Africa has seen four successful coups in the past 18 months alone, plus two unsuccessful coups. These recent coups and related installation of military men as heads of state are part of an overall democratic backsliding trend in West Africa today. So you may well ask, why should military coups and other indications of democratic backsliding in West Africa be concerning to anybody, including those of us in this room? This is the question I seek to answer in the next two sections of this lecture. And I'll do so starting from the vantage of the region's early post-colonial era 
that's uh, roughly 1960 to 1990, which to me offers an example of the benefits of the democracy dividend, and which also hints at the cost of democracy backsliding. I will address the same question in the later section of the presentation, uh, at this time, at that time, from the standpoint of contemporary realities and developments in the region and the world around it. And also try to show why autocratization and retreat from democracy is the wrong way to go for West Africa and how it could plunge the region into chaos. And I'll close their presentation with a few suggestions on what we could do or what should be done to stem this tide. So let me begin my story. Shortly after independence, most West African leaders discarded or significantly abridged the formal liberal democratic constitutions they inherited from colonial authorities. They typically cited as their primary justification, the need to secure national stability and peace for rapid social and economic development or to save the nation, so to speak. But autocratic rule brought widespread political instability and social and socioeconomic decay in the region. By the early 1980s, by the 1980s and early 1990s, most West African country, countries, as you recall, were stuck in a rut of political turmoil, civil unrest, a cycle of coups and military insurrections to save the nation, almost always followed by political and economic crisis. On the UNDP's HDI for 1990, the average score for the 15 member countries of ECOWAS was an abysmal 0.169 compared to 0.62 for Latin America and 0.976 for the United States. Be that as it may, many countries in West Africa as elsewhere in Africa did embark on democratic reforms in the 1990s as the third, third wave of democratization shaped global trends. With Benin leading the West African part, most ECOWAS member states adopted more or less democratic constitutions that now included bill, bills of rights and some degree of separation of powers. They revived parliaments, they allowed more or less competitive multi-party elections to be held, they reduced state monopolies over mass media and the telecom sector and relaxed official censorship. And they expanded associational freedoms, which then made it possible for opposition parties as well as civil society groups to thrive. In the decade and a half of these democratic transitions, West Africa started to increasingly see stability, peace, and material progress. The sub-region became an African democratic governance trailblazer of some sort with the following bragging rights. It became the region where the commitment to the ballot box as the sole legitimate mechanism for choosing political leaders became firmly rooted. It was also the region whose leaders had banded together to bring an end to devastating civil wars in Liberia and Sierra Leone and had resolved political conflicts and restored democratic order in Burkina Faso, in Mali, and in Cote d'Ivoire. During this time, ECOWAS established a distinguished record of adopting and enforcing protocols that formally proscribed military coups and other unconstitutional power grabs. And in 2015, ECOWAS came close to making presidential term limits a regional norm before it was blocked by two, the two remaining autocratic regimes of the time, Togo and Gambia. And in much the same period, in much of the same period, many countries in the region enjoyed unprecedented stability and peace. Large scale political violence waned considerably and casualties from violent 
conflict decline across the sub-region. In 2002 and 2005, respectively, Sierra Leone and Liberia famously entered eras of post-conflict peace following the ending of the civil wars and the conduct of successful elections. And after a brief relapse into civil war, fought over elections between 2010 and 2011, Cote d'Ivoire returned to stability. This democratic era, that's 2000 to 2015, also saw significant socioeconomic growth in the region. And according to the World Bank, the average annual GDP growth rate of the 15 ECOWAS countries in 1980 to 1990 had been 1.98%. But in 1990, to 2000, that's 10 years later, that rate almost doubled to 3.76. And in the first decade of the 21st century, it rose further to 4.38, which then was part of the uh, narrative of Africa rising. In 1992, also uh, useful to note that the ECO, as I said, the ECOWAS countries had recorded an average of 0 0.169 on the UNDP's uh, Human Development Index. But by, 19, by 2010, this average had risen to 0 0.374. So you look at this recent history of peace, stability, and material progress under democratic rule that West Africa enjoyed from roughly uh, 2000 to, to, to 2015. That should set some sort of background against which we can now look at the story of democratic backsliding in the region today, and also partially at least explain why I for one think that is that should give us cause to worry. It's not only the recent dramatic return of taking power through the barrel of the gun that is worrisome, but it's also uh, the fact that you have an increasing incidence of democratically elected presidents breaching their own, the, the constitutional term limit provisions in their own constitutions and controversially winning third term bits. This has happened in Togo with Iyadema. It has happened in Cote d'Ivoire with Alassane Ouattara, and then with the deposed Alpha Conde of Guinea. But I think even more than that, some developments in the region star democracies are even more worrisome. So if you take Benin, for instance, President Patrice Talon has systematically dismantled institutions central for preserving pluralism and maintaining checks and balances. He has suppressed the opposition and engineered the de facto one party legislature by barring opposition parties from fielding candidates in the last parliamentary election held in 20, 2019. So it's not surprising Benin has been ranked down by, in Freedom House, by Freedom House. Uh, Benin was ranked free almost from the beginning of his democratization period. But since 2019, it has lost that rank. It's now considered partly, partly, partly free. Then is Senegal, considered to be one of the most democratic countries in the sub-region. Here too, President Marcus Sall has been very coy about whether or not he will interpret the constitutional referendum of 2016 as a reset that allows him to run for a third term at the end of his current second term. Meanwhile, he has changed election and defamation laws to constrain the opposition and to censor the media. And again, Senegal's Freedom House ranking has dropped from free to partly free since 2020. Then Ghana, which continues to be ranked as free but has its much vaunted reputation for reasonably clean elections, 
increasingly tarnished by violence with no consequence, including most recently eight reported fatalities related to the December 2020 polls. And then since his re-election in 2020, President Akufuado has among other instances of executive overreach, forced an assertive Auditor General into retirement. And the Ghanaian judiciary, which has had a fairly, fairly solid positive reputation for a long time, is increasingly perceived as pliant for its growing tendency to rule in favor of the incumbent president and the governing party. And moreover, a shockingly draconian anti-LGBT bill is being considered in the Ghanaian parliament. This is a bill that will criminalize homosexuality as well as advocacy for LGBT rights and would mandate conversion therapy. So I now come back to address the question of why we must be concerned about democratic backsliding in West Africa. By this time, I do so in the context of contemporary, contemporary realities and the unfolding developments in the region. And in, indeed, history may suggest the possibility that democratic backsliding could push the region back into its unhappy past of political turmoil, civil unrest, cycles of coups, and so on. But to me, history is not the only reason to be concerned about the, the retreat from democracy ongoing in West Africa today. It is the contemporary realities combined with troubling regional as well as global developments together that make the ongoing democratic backsliding nightmarish as far as I'm concerned. So let's look at some of these contemporary realities and why I think uh, they bode ill for the region. I divide them into two broadly and roughly. One are those that are maybe, maybe described as homegrown or internal, and the others that may be described as external, environmental, or maybe altogether, I call them today's air winds. To quote the famous American politician, it is the economy stupid. Despite significant progress made over the last two decades, politically damaging poverty and inequality remain persistent everywhere in the region. Growth rates have decelerated in many countries. Growth, if there is any, remains, still remains driven by primary commodity production and is of poor quality and with few jobs created and its benefits not shared equitably. We see wide gaps in the delivery of healthcare, education, infrastructure, and safety and security. And misgovernance remains rampant with persistent or deepening government corruption, abuse of power, and official impunity. And a mismanaged youth bulge has left millions of jobless, disconnected young West Africans vulnerable to traffickers who promise a better life elsewhere or to recruitment by bandits and jihadists. For all these reasons, young West Africans are still risking their lives crossing the desert or the ocean to find a better life. These are some of the reasons behind reports of young people in Nigeria and Senegal rushing to the, to the Ukrainian embassies in their respective countries to sign up as mercenaries to fight for Ukraine. In addition to these homegrown issues, West African nations are confronted by nasty challenges, not necessarily of their own making. These include climate change, whose impact is already being felt and is driving farming and farmer header and other conflicts and as well as migration. 
Then there is the COVID-19 pandemic that according to the African Development Bank caused a 2% sorry, 2% economic contraction in West Africa. And then there is this year's Russian invasion of Ukraine, which is driving punishing inflation as well as prices of petroleum, fertilizer, and some food commodities skyrocketing. And perhaps the greatest existential threat facing the region, violent extremism, and its re related radicalization, illicit trafficking, and insurgency. This has been spreading throughout the region beginning with the jihadist attacks by Boko Haram in Northern Nigeria and Niger in the early 2000s, followed by a proliferation of outsider groups, including affiliates of ISIS and ISIL. Tapping into deep-seated community tensions, taking advantage of vast swathes of ungoverned spaces in the countryside and people facing economic desperation, these extremists have been grabbing territories, controlling economic activities, and triggering further political instability in the region. And in fact, the recent terrorist attacks further south, even in coastal countries of West Africa, such as Benin and Cote d'Ivoire, give testimony to the continued spread of these groups in the ECOWAS region. All these challenges of course, have greatly compounded and exacerbated the region's ongoing difficulties and hugely increased the pro prospects for implosion. But how are West African, uh, West Africa's democratic governments responding to this mat material welfare and existential crisis facing their nations? The primary response they've given to these grave challenges has not been democratic. Rather, many of the region's political elites, particularly those in power or allied with them, have largely preoccupied themselves with capturing key institutions and processes, including democratic ones, in order to control, to secure control over the state and the resources that it controls. And in, and in an era when, when elections are widely seen as the only legitimate means of gaining political power, these elites are increasingly resorting to rigging, vote buying, vote intimidation, and even violence to pursue victory at the polls. Some incumbent governments have actually been using the genuine dangers and threats presented by violent, violent extremists and other risk of public assembly during the pandemic, for instance, as cover to abridge freedoms and retreat from democracy. Many have been victimizing government critics with dubious ar arrest, prosecutions, and imprisonment, and denigrating legitimate citizen protest activities as politically motivated, subversive, treasonous, or even terroristic. They have been resorting increasingly to internet and social media blackouts and other forms of censorship. And above all, governments have become more aggressive in developing, in deploying state law enforcement and security agencies to intimidate and even violently suppress protesters. I could list many examples of this, but one of the most horrific examples of this is the October 2020 massacre of protesters at the Lekito booth in Nigeria. I admit that the challenges facing West Africa today will be daunting for any country and for any ideological or governance system, democratic or not, and for any, for any leader. But what we can deny is that they could plunge the entire country into deep chaos all by themselves. But my point is that democratic backsliding and autocratization make things much, much worse. For example, contentious elections distract leaders from tackling the threat of jihadism, 
leaders divert external military and security assistance away from jihadist threat towards crushing the political opposition, often uh, in you know, down south, uh, where then in the capital uh, cities. Repressive and abusive conduct by state security agencies in the name of combating terrorism and violent extremism only deepens mistrust between central government and the peripheral communities, which then opens the way for exploitation by jihadists and other rogue actors. And internet and social media bans damage already weakened economies, as Nigeria uh, discovered, the Nigerian government discovered when it tried, they, 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 they banned Twitter and other uh, social media for some time. This tsunami of factors points to a near future in which West Africa's government find themselves grappling with severe economic distress and security threats while simultaneously being confronted by a growing citizen discontent, strife, and unrest. But in their determination to cling to power by any means necessary, some governments, elected or not, may choose and are choosing stronger repression instead of listening to their citizens. So we may ask, who can stop them? A decade ago, the regional body ECOWAS might have offered some protection against backsliding, but that is no longer the case. Its capacity to enforce democratic norms has significantly declined so much that the Malian junta rejected ECOWAS's ECOWAS timetable for holding elections. And in another act of defiance, the junta has hired the Russian mercenary group, the Wagner Group, to protect the regime. Sadly, today, and, and West Africa is far away from the situation in the 2000s when many of its leaders enthusiastically signed on to the protocol on democracy good, and good governance and also embraced the African peer review mechanism. These days, the region is lacking leaders like former President John Kufo and Olusegun Obasanjo and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, all of whom robustly championed the region's democratic governance renaissance. And instead, the current crop of West African leaders demonstrate ambiguity in, their, in terms of their commitment to democracy and accountable governance. So it's instructive, for instance, to note that Ghana's president, the Kufuado, attended the inaugurations of Afa Konde and Alassane Ouattara after their controversial third term wins. But there are other factors beyond the region that are also contributing to today's democratic backsliding and autocratization and all that go with that. During the democratic heyday of the 1990s and 2000s, there were Afri West African democratization got a lot of help from the West, as it were. But these days, uh, the West doesn't have the same financial and diplomatic clout it used to hold over West Africa for reasons that uh, time would not permit me to go into. It's also true that many Western governments have shifted their focus towards new goals. They are now focusing on managing relationships with China and Russia and other emerging powers, fighting global terrorism and others. And that doesn't leave, leave them with too much room to pay attention to matters of democracy or democrat, democratic backsliding in West Africa. Another significant change is the rise of China as a global power. China sees opportunities to counter the West all over Africa, and to do so while gaining access to much needed resources. In exchange for commodities and diplomatic influence, China has invested heavily in the construction of roads, rail, and diplomatic com and, and communication and other infrastructure in, under its Belt and Roads Initiative. And unlike Western governments and international financial institutions that are affiliated with the West, China imposes no demands for transparency 
accountability or democratic rights. In fact, China's opaque, opaque lending practices and collusive deals with the region's leaders thrive where independent media and civil society are weak and institutional checks and balances are ineffective. And more recently, Russia has returned to the African scene. It's seeking to regain influence in the region by offering military and security assistance, especially to governments struggling to overcome violent extremists and other insurrections, including the Sahelian zone of West Africa. Alarmingly, much of Russia's involvement in West Africa is being done through the private military contractor, the Wagner Group. And of course, Russia has also taken advantage of the growing anti-France sentiment in the region, but especially in the Francophone parts of West Africa by promoting its mercenaries as an alternative to French military support. So here you see uh, the waving of uh, Russian flags and flag cast by Burkina Bid demonstrating in support of the military coup and the new junta stance against France and ECOWAS. And then last but not the least, the emergence of illiberal leaders across the globe, which, uh, which provide masterclasses in how to weaken institutional checks and balances and undermine the rule of law and provoke culture wars, especially uh, anti-gay fever in West Africa. So where is autocratization and democrat democratic backsliding taking West Africa in its so-called democratic age? Here, I turn to the Afrobarometer and what Afrobarometer polling done over a two, a two decade period uh, has been telling us about the attitudes and opinions and values of ordinary Africans with respect to democracy and accountable governance. And I can report that these attitudes are by and large liberal, pro-democratic, pro-accountable governance and anti-authoritarian. In the, la the latest round of the survey, that's round eight, um, 19, 2019 to 2021, across 14 West African countries, three quarters said they chose democracy, they choose democracy, and even more resound resoundingly rejected authoritarian alternatives such as one man rule, one party rule, and military rule. And more remarkable for a region with huge gaps in government effectiveness, a clear majority of West Africans agreed or strongly agreed with the proposition that it is more important for government to be accountable to the people than to get things done. It's also important to note that clear majorities did express support for fundamental human rights and personal freedom. An average of two thirds demanded freedom of association and free media. Okay. So I've just, these slides are showing sort of over time trends uh, for um, the popular support for democracy and democratic norms and institutions um, in, in, in West Africa. Um, demand for democratic norms, uh, elections and press, presidential term limits and so on. And again, you notice that either in most cases, the trend has stayed fairly strong, I mean, has positive and strong, and, um, and, in, and some, in some places, firm enough. But when you place this side by side with uh, supply though, then you see that there are uh, major gaps in how much people, West Africans say they want democracy and how much of it they think they are getting. In fact, if you match the Afrobarometer's democracy uh, supply index, which we derive from uh, those, the average of those who describe their country as mostly or completely democratic, 
and also describe themselves as satisfied with the way democracy works in the country. Then let me go back to okay. If you look at this chart, what you would see generally is that um, the over time, that's the bottom, the bottom slide. I mean, the bottom line um, is telling you about overall what we, our index of the demand for democracy. And per this, 49% of West Africans across uh, 14 countries where say that 13 countries are saying that they want to live under democratic gov uh, governments. But if you look at the supply um, by in the last round, the average supply index came as low as 38%. So you are talking of an 11 percentage point gap between expectations of democracy and perceived delivery of democracy. And of course, ordinary West Africans do perceive increasing levels of corruption among government officials and institutions, particularly the presidency. And they report declining levels of trust in government leaders, particularly, again, the presidency. And they believe that officials who commit crimes do go and punish. On top of this, pessimism about the future is rising among West Africans in a dangerous way. And that between 2011 and 2013, 2011, 2013 and 2019, 2021, there has been a 15 percentage point rise in levels of pessimism about the direction in which the country is going. These factors, these realities of public opinion, in my view, should trouble all of us. And this current situation sets the stage indeed for political tension and conflict and pit citizens against their governments and their and political elites. So getting to the end of the presentation, we ask how are ordinary citizens in the region trying to bridge this gap? Across the region, the popular desire for democracy and for accountable governance and for better livelihood and so on has frequently played out in real time, often in the streets, but also in the media and especially social media and even in the courts. A dramatic example of this street protest occurred in Nigeria in two, two, for two weeks in October 2020, thousands of Nigerians, mostly young people, held protests, including night vigils at the Lekito Lake booth in Lagos and other cities in southern Nigeria. The youth were protesting the police's special anti robbery squad, SARS, which had been set up in 1992 to combat a wave of robberies but had since become by many accounts, a criminal organization in itself, victimizing and extorting from citizens. For years, the authorities had ignored calls to bring SARS to order, but a viral video appeared to show SARS agents shooting a man in the street and stealing his car in broad daylight. And this triggered put a protest movement that became known as the hashtag NSAS, one of the biggest in Nigeria's history. Other examples of popular, popular protests include mass and mass demonstrations were held, include those held in many countries against their incumbent, their respective incumbent presidents, third term bits in Togo between 2017 and 2019 in Guinea between 2015 and 2020, and in Burkina Faso in 2014. In the case of Burkina Faso, uh, over the pre President Kampuari's attempt to permanently stay in office by abolishing 
presidential term limits. And in fact, this was, it was basically a popular coup that pushed Kampuari out of office. And then later on, when his, uh, co his comrades tried to restore him in power, it was still citizens of Burkina, Burkina Faso who foiled that coup. So the, the struggle for democracy and accountability is be, it's also being waged off the streets and that across the region, countless activists, journalists, opposition leaders, ordinary citizens, and some, even some state officials are joining the battle. These are large armies referred to by some as a resistance bureau are making unique contributions. They are challenging, challenging government corruption, they are demanding accountability, and they are speaking truth to power. And these bureau's most formidable foot soldiers include a new generation of creatives and artists, such as Ghana's cartoonists called Tilapia, then satirist and social commentator Adiola Fayehun of Nigeria, it also includes uh, it includes Nigerian DJ and musician, producer and activist DJ Switch, and it includes Aisha Yesufu, who is a co-founder of the uh, Nigerian Bring Back Our Girls movement. It also includes. Ibrahim Sise, a Gambian filmmaker and social activist, and Abigail Freeman, a Liberian women's rights advocate. All these are people generally in their 20s, a couple of them early 30s. Now, I think when you look at all of this, then to me, there is hope in a, there's hope in the horizon. And that this, to, for us to get a sense of why I think there is hope, let's go back to the Lekito booth and the demonstrations that took place there. When the governor of Lagos State ordered the protesters to disperse, they defied him and stayed put, blocking traffic along a major artery. After dark on October 20, Someone turned off the CCTV camera. The popular Nigerian musician and this jockey, DJ Switch, turned on her camera and started live streaming the attack on, Insta on her Instagram page, a courageous act that helped to debunk the government's subsequent denials. In fact, the federal government's information minister had infamously and disingenuously quipped at the time that if the alleged massacre was true, it would be the first one in history where there was no blood or bodies. But under intense public pressure, the government announced the abolition of the SARS unit and the international broadcast of a video footage of the shooting, deaths and injuries went viral and compelled the government to set up a public commission of inquiry whose report, not too surprisingly, vindicated the activist claims that government forces had indeed committed a massacre. Now, here is um, this young lady here, Rinu Uduala, at, the, at work at the Lekki to, to booth. The NSAS protest itself has been started in part by this young woman, at that time, a 22-year-old university student. Renu was the, one of the first to take to the streets after a video went viral of a man allegedly, allegedly killed by SARS. She set up camp outside the Lagos governor's office, demanded that the police unit be disbanded. The Nigerian government felt so threatened by this 22-year-old that they froze her bank account. As death threats against her and her family mounted, she was forced into exile. But despite these extreme hardships, this brave young woman has not let go 
of her commitment to working for a better Nigeria. Renu also provides a very good representation of West Africa's anti-autocracy resistance bureaus, bureau and its youthful, decidedly youthful face. Intrepid, highly resourceful, and tech savvy, these mainly youthful activists in the streets and on the social media and the courtrooms have brought new vigor and dynamism to popular challenges against abuse of power, human rights violations, corruption, and the like. And these are, of course, the source of activists who were involved in the massive street protests in Guinea, Togo, that I mentioned earlier. I predict that autocratization and democratic backsliding, therefore, will continue to collide with citizens and populations whose material expectations are not being met, whose attitudes are largely pro-democratic, pro-accountable governance, and whose energies are coalescing into this mainly youthful resistance bureau. So my final remarks, what is to be done? First, to, to, to pivot around the many West Africans who are standing up for democracy, human rights, and accountable governance, and to say that they are the most important actors to support. So how can they be best helped as they push against the slide towards autocracy? The following measures will be crucial in my view, and they should be supported by African as well as regional and international funds of democracy. One, undertaking constitutional reform to enhance checks and balances and interbranch accountability in national constitutions. Two, enacting laws to enable credible reg regulation of political party financing, especially campaign financing and promoting enforcement of such laws. Three, building the capacities of think tanks university research institutes and pro-democracy human rights civic activist groups to conduct independent monitoring of democratic governance progress and retrogression. Four, strengthening sub-regional pan-African and international alliances that can engage to defend democratic governance norms and practices. And it will be particularly useful in this regard to strengthen ECOWAS and the African Union's initiatives to monitor and confront incumbent leaders' violations of democracy and good governance in real time. And above all, building defense walls to protect non-state civil society and media actors against predatory state and partisan political actors. These defense walls should include constitutional and legal protections, diplomatic support, and even a legal defense fund. And speaking directly to the United States and other Western democracies, I strongly recommend that you leverage your limited, but still strategically and symbolically important military and security assistance to West African countries and ECOWAS. That security assistance should be used towards promoting accountable governance particularly by supporting local civil society and media capacity building, by, it should be by promoting international cooperation to check illicit financial flows and other corrupting influences on internal politics of West African nations, and also promoting inclusive developments, particularly job creating growth with a focus on, on regions where extremists find fertile grounds. To conclude, I do not believe that the full descent into anarchy in West Africa is a, West, it's a foregone conclusion. The skills, energy, and dedication of, resistance, of the resistance bureau actors, to me, inspire hope, and we must help them. Thank you. Wow, what a great lecture. Thank you so much, Jima. Uh, before I um, open it up for questions uh, and comments, um, let me just observe that we're somewhat double dipping today because we not only have uh, 
the recent former executive director of the Afrobarometer, but the new executive director of the Afrobarometer. So Joseph Asunka, who was our neighbor at the Hewlett Foundation not long ago, welcome to you. And it's our honor to have you here as well. So um, the floor uh, is open for questions and comments. Uh, anyone want to proceed? Yes? Maybe just wait for the mic so our online audience can hear you as well. Um, I'm Vicki Brooks. Thank you so much for your insightful yet sad uh, lecture here. Um, I'm a former Peace Corps volunteer from uh, Tanzania, but um, my my uh, and my interest was to see if you would include the uh, information about China and its impact on all of. Uh, the countries in Africa, and um, I'm I'm learning too uh, in the past how many people that they would bring over and use and and pay and bring families and people over to take the jobs that they were creating for this country and for the countries and um, not not um, not using local people and paying them for that. So I, I thank you for including that in your remarks. And uh, like America, you know, we all hope that the young people will speak truth to power here, as well as how they're doing in, in um, those West African countries. So thank you so much. You want to reply? Hi, um, thanks again for such a, such a fascinating lecture. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about how this democratic backsliding and kind of the associated uh, lack of confidence in these national institutions affects confidence in kind of other institutions. So there's this whole body of work that, you know, kind of tries to understand, you know, why do institutions like uh, customary chiefs retain so much uh, power in West Africa, despite, you know, kind of growing movements towards democracy in the country, because these are like embedded authoritarianisms. But with the, with the kind of decrease in democratic legitimacy of these uh, national governments, you might expect a change in opinions about these embedded authoritarian governments that, you know, they were never democratic to, to start with, but maybe now that doesn't matter as much. So I was wondering if you'd seen any movement on that in any of the Afrobarometer indicators. Yes, but we, there are there are there, there are indicators. We we do have the data covers um, the traditional authorities and other informal leaders as well. Um, and it's true, you know, they continue to uh, to carry a lot of legitimacy. They continue. To, well, First, when you ask people uh, who they take their problems to, when they tend to take their problems to either traditional leaders or religious leaders in the communities. But that, I think, is a function of uh, the absence of the state and, and state institutions, uh, and not necessarily um, a choice. You know, it's not like a choice between the two that they make. The, the, the state is usually too absent or inaccessible. Um, then also, I kind of think it's easy to, to, uh, to love and to retain affection for uh, one that makes no demands on you. I mean, many of these traditional rulers, uh, have, they don't have taxation powers anymore, and that was taken away from them long ago. So as objects of affection, well, you know, everybody needs someone to to laugh, and, uh, <laughs> we, 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 so they carry that. And then I think the more the government is improvident, the more the government is uh, pred predatory, then it makes uh, these uh, traditional authorities look like father figures and that you can go to and get some comfort. But I don't think they are really in competition with the state as such. And also because many of them are part of the elites, both at the national level and at the local level. They've all, they, they are almost always, at least those in Ghana, are implicated in the democracy and state, state capture games 
that are being played out right now. Okay, we'll go to our FSI director, Mike McFall, and then to our CDDRL colleague, Stephen Stedman. Thank you, fantastic lecture. Um, I have lots of questions, but let me just focus on one about the US. Um, as it happens, I had a visitor from Africa today at my office, um, and I was showing the photo of when President Obama gave a, a pretty fantastic speech whether there was good policy implementation after that is a different matter when he visited Accra in 2009. Um, and then we had a period in the United States, and I'm gonna try to be diplomatic about this. Uh, we had a president that I don't think paid much attention to Africa. I think that's fair to say. I think he had a name for those countries and it began with an S. Okay, but, but there was hope, I, I would say, when President uh, Biden was elected, uh, that he was gonna correct the neglect uh, to issues, A, towards Africa, but B, towards democracy, right? And he gave many speeches, autocrats versus Democrats. Uh, he held a democracy summit, at least online. Um, give us an update. It's about a year and a half in, a year and three, three months in. Is there an appreciable change in terms of American engagement with this set of issues in West Africa or, or not? And, and it's related to the question about China. That's one rising China doing this, that, and the other. I'm interested in it, the American absence that was there for at least four years and maybe longer. Uh, is it back or is it not really changed that much? It's, it's a difficult question for me to answer because I also realize there is a lot uh, that goes uh, on under my radar, um, especially in terms of uh, security sector, uh, engagements, engagements with the security sector, even in Ghana, where I live, uh, there, it's, you know, every once in a while you see a headline that, you know, there is uh, this arrangement, um, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, my former institution is uh, running some programs on border security that uh, the US government funds that the European Union and others are funding. But in terms of uh, democracy, all that um, has happened was the uh, Biden uh, summit on democracy or non-summit on democracy, uh, maybe. Uh, and I think a number of West African presidents uh, did sign up. Um, the last time I checked, uh, the Ghana government, for instance, had not yet submitted um, its formal statement and had not yet granted permission for the one that it made at the summit to be posted as its official commitment. That may have been corrected by now, but um, it's very slow. In terms of US engagement on re-engagement with Africa on democratic governance issues is very slow. Uh, USA you know, seems to be going through endless rounds of um, reviewing its programs and um, there's oh, every now and then talk of uh, major program reset that may bring democracy and governance back, but I am yet to see it. And maybe it's because I am not in the line of, you know, I'm not, I'm sort of I'm not heading any institution, not having executive authority means, I don't know much of what goes on in the corridors of power. Okay, Steve. So, uh, Jim, if, if if this was a talk on America's democratic backsliding, you would have heard first uh, the word polarization many times. And secondly, you would also hear about social media intensifying uh, polarization and making it worse. Um, so it struck me that you gave a talk on democratic backsliding that didn't at once reference polarization in the region within countries. Um, and secondly, the, the tale that you told about the activists is very much a, a return to the idea that these kinds of technologies can be liberation technologies and not just um, funnels for uh, democratic backsliding and polarization. So could you comment on, on, on both of those in the region? Hmm. There is, there is polarization, a lot of it, but it's polarization um, in, in a, in, for reasons that are slightly different from what I see about the United States. 
So there is a lot of um, partisanship, crude partisanship uh, between, say, the governing New Patriotic Party of Ghana and the main opposition National Democratic Party. But both of them are basically um, competing for control over the state. So for them, election and all of this is not so they come to power and they uh, pursue democratic governance and they do great economic reforms and um, do all the things that we hope governments will do for people. It's just um, uh, an opportunity to basically uh, to, to eat. So it's um, polarization in the manner that maybe two boxes uh, fighting for a big price or fight you know, brutally and maim and kill themselves. So whoever emerges, the winner can go and take the big price but not polarization in the, in the way uh, it, it's not about fighting to save the system. It's basically fighting to take over the system and to cut it up and eat it. So it's slightly different. Now within the media, uh, I mean, there is still some um, huge and abusive use of the media all across, including civic, you know, some, some, well, not civic activists of the type I'm describing, but if you are, uh, if you are uh, Boko Haram, you are using social media for your ends. If you are, you know, these insurgents are using social media for, for their ends. And then for government, it's a tool for spreading all kinds of disinformation and among the opposition part, between the opposition and the incumbent governing parties, again, these are all tools that they are using in their, uh, in their fight against each other. Um, I don't get a sense that it is systematically an anti-democratic tool. In fact, I think on the net, on, on the average, it is, it is a positive tool. It's, it's being used to advance uh, goals that I, I, I side with, but uh, it could turn, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'd look at how the Nigerian activists work their way around the Twitter ban and so on, and basically uh, disarmed the government and made the government look quite foolish for, and childish for uh, trying to do that in the first place. Uh, at, by, by dinner time, I would think of a better response. Okay, uh, in back and then to Alberto. Hi, um, thank you for such a phenomenally informative and stimulating lecture. Um, well, I was thinking through kind of uh, what you had to say about why we sitting here in the United States should be concerned about democratic backsliding in West Africa. I, you know, very, in the main agreed, um, but had kind of a quibble in the back of my mind of a potentially incongruent example in the case of Rwanda, where I think we could certainly say that there are some considerable concerns about the level of democracy, um, but where uh, in spite of those concerns, um, the West has remained quite close to the state in Rwanda, and where also there's been um, considerable sort of economic stability um, and enough uh, sort of political stability, lack of violence to sustain that economic stability. Um, so if we're thinking about democratic backsliding going on in states in West Africa, what does the example of Rwanda mean um, for that? So do we think that there's a necessary incongruity between um, democratic backsliding and economic uh, success? and um, also sort of popular satisfaction with life. And then also, if we think about sort of our position as United States toward um, states in Western Africa that are undergoing uh, democratic backsliding, could the case of Rwanda tell us perhaps that it's kind of, um, in some cases, a better idea to remain close to an existing government, even if it's not as democratic as we'd like it to be today, because um, backing away or exiting could allow um, another contender, like say Russia and Mali, 
to come in if we are absenting ourselves? It's a, it's, it's a big question. And these these, these, these issues, um, uh, live issues for many West Africans today, and especially, you know, uh, professionals and some academics, you know, this is um, a, a, a big deal. But my own personal position on this is that no West African country is like Rwanda. No West African country quite has the same history, the same, the same profile and others. And that really to have a Rwanda um, as a good example for any West African country is first to get a, the reset of genocide and then to have um, one brilliant leader emerge uh, who uh, knows how to keep it all going and to have this leader not never die you know have him live forever and then uh, maybe we could because we can't replicate any of these things we can't have genocide we can't have a kagami and we can't have a if we have one we can't have one that will live forever we still have to do development uh, democracy and development the same hard way everybody else does it and that you got you know, Rwanda remains still such an ex exception to the rule that um, I hope nobody is uh, building uh, a rule out of an exception. Okay, uh, I want to go to uh, Alberto Diaz Calleros, uh, next our colleague at CGDRL, and then we have a question via Zoom. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I, I want to particularly thank you for showing us the pictures of the activists, and I do want you to tell us a little bit, I have actually two questions, but whether there's ways in which we can bring those activists and help empower them in the way they're transforming their societies. So I come from Latin America, where I think that is where the biggest hope is right now in, in the way our systems are backsliding as well. But on the more sort of less optimistic side of things, um, I was really struck by three coups in 18 months. And that seems very different from Latin America. The Latin American playbook seems to be more about, you know, term limits, subverting this kind of democratic institutions. So do you think this coup trend is going to be a trend or, or is this just a little blip, uh, but most of it is going to be more about the quality of democracy and dissatisfaction and this kind of, you know, parties that stay there or leaders that stay there for longer than they should. And if you're looking Africa wide, I think it's something like five coups in, in the last yeah. uh, three years or something. Anyway, go ahead. So the coups, I mean, to begin with, um, so the West African coups, they don't, they, they don't spring from exactly the same origins. You know, there's the, 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 the Mali and Burkina coups have a lot to do with the, um, growing insecurity and uh, safety concerns of ordinary Malians and Burkina Bay because of the jihadist onslaught and the failure of government and its government security forces to stem that tide. But implicated in all of this, it's also misgovernance. So in the case of Mali, it had something to do, the first coup, the one in 2020, had something to do with um, the way the, that, that president pre, uh, forced the elections um, and essentially uh, here was a pandemic. Uh, he insisted on having elections uh, in the course of the campaign. Lead, the opposition leader was uh, kidnapped. He still said, let's go ahead with the elections. Uh, he basically decided to make the elections the main, his main uh, strategy for uh, overcoming the security threat, but it was also more um, more like part of his own uh, self-preservation self uh, strategy. Uh, mind you, his that president's brother was involved in all kinds of scams and corruption. Um, when the coup occurred, his ongoing hotel resort was uh, a big target of public 
anger and um, they went and trashed and took things away and all of that. So Mali, yes, yeah, security threat, but also misgovernance. Burkina, Burkina Faso, a lot of it had to do with security threat and less for misgovernance. Guinea is clearly, was clearly um, the result of a president who was aging, who was out, who's totally out of touch, 82 going on 83 years, who had just essentially forced his way back to power, whose first act in the first year in office was to reduce the, to cut the salaries of public servants, including the security services and others. I've been I've in the, I can give a whole lecture on why, in my view, we should also be concerned with aging um, autocratic leaders or aging, and maybe if they were not autocratic in their youth, become more so, you know, and, as, and also out of touch and make all kinds of catastrophic decisions that nobody with their full weight on should make. So there is also some of that. But in general, in terms of the coup trend, I think coups be, beget coups. And um, I'm particularly worried about it, the coup trend on account of the age of the coup leaders. You have you know, coup leaders, the last three uh, coups in, in, in the region, the leaders ages, age, the age ranges from 37 to 41. And at that age, you have a lot of life to live. And it's not surprising to me that all of them are resisting a shorter timetable for return to democratic rule. And most likely for, the, for those three countries, you are talking of a repeat of Ghana, Gambia, and others in the 1980s, where you had very young leaders staging coup, becoming president, and who just simply are too young to leave office. Well, and General uh, al-Sisi in Egypt was not nearly that young when he took power in 2013. You know, you can be in your 50s and decide you're too young to leave office. That's true. Um, I do want to say before we go to the Zoom question, uh, Alberto, Aisha Yusufu uh, was a, a Draper Hill Summer Fellow last summer. DJ Switch was a fellow, a Reagan Fassell fellow at NED. Uh, we got lots of these types of people coming into the Draper Hills Summer Fellows Program at CDDRL. Okay, over to Zoom. Jacob Al Hassan uh, first thanks you for a wonderful lecture uh, and asks, I wonder if some of the causes of instability are also simply conflicts of the youth versus what seems like an entrenched political establishment. Beyond the remarkable resistance our West African youth have mounted, is there more that we as youth from West Africa could do to consolidate our democracies? Hmm. So I, I agree with the, the, with the premise of the, of, 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 of the question. So first, you have a, a median age of 18.2 for West Africa. And then you have, uh, if you take away the recent coup leaders, the rest of the leaders average age is about 63 years or thereabout. Uh, some of them, you know, President Kufuado is 78, um, Buhari is 79, his likely successor is uh, at least 70. Um, you have, Watara, who is uh, 80 or thereabout, and so on. So when you have uh, a leadership profile of this age, of this type versus a general population age profile of that type, there is definitely a disconnect. And I think there's a way in which you have leaders who simply are, are organically inher and inherently not likely to understand many of the people that they are governing and uh, the way they think and the way they do things and uh, who do better to uh, have, I think West Africa will do better with slightly younger leaders. And um, it makes me feel, so, you know, I'm, I'm in that generation, but I, my sympathy lies with the, with the younger food because I, I think we all get tired somehow. Uh, any other questions from the audience or Zoom? We've got one more from Zoom. Eric Beecham 
um, also says beautiful and insightful lecture uh, and asks, as the co-founder of Afrobarometer and Center for Democratic Development, could you highlight some of the challenges that think tanks and research institutions in Africa face in their quest to promote democracy and also their quest to let public opinions influence policymaking in Africa? Well, thanks, thanks for that question. I don't, I don't know of any uh, I don't know of any 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 country or any leader who who likes uh, to hear bad news, and so to the extent that the alphabarometer data very often contains uh, uh, news that governments deem information that governments deem unflattering about themselves. Basically, they are being shown uh, they are being shown a mirror of themselves themselves in a mirror. And they often don't like the image they see. They think they are far prettier than what they see. They think they are, they are much more loved by the people. They are more trusted. And when the results say, show that they are not trusted or they are not as well liked or they are not doing as well, um, they get quite upset. And um, you know, blaming the messenger is an old, old trick in the book. But nonetheless, I think it's, Good news, with, as far as Afrobiometry is concerned, you know, when we started, we could only work in 12 countries because conditions in just about every other, every, any, other, any other country was simply too hostile. The fact that we now ask the same questions in um, as many as 36 countries now going 40 also says something about maybe how far we have come you know, as a continent and um, uh, how, how things are not as impossibly bad today as they were, just that we are at a point where, an inflection point where if we don't act and if we don't act fast, we may return to those bad old days. And that has been the burden of my, my, my talk. Great, well, let me uh, conclude with the following observations. Um, uh, I think we have been in a uh, global democratic recession since around 2005, 2006. The data show probably won't surprise you that there's probably been more backward movement for democracy and freedom in Sub-Saharan Africa than in any other region of the world, in part because there were a lot of democracies to, uh, uh, to slip back uh, in Africa, and there had been a lot of progress. Uh, and now I think Jima has painted a somewhat alarming portrait for us of an acceleration of that trend. Of course, it's accelerating globally, uh, but uh, three coups in West Africa, five, six on the continent, that's pretty uh, worrisome and just in a few years. And especially in his country, which has been a shining star of relatively liberal uh, democracy in Africa, but what's different now from the previous uh, backlash or recession against democracy after the first post-independence liberation is that you have the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, you have the Afrobarometer, and you have a network of very brave and internationally connected activists, intellectuals, friends in the West um, who are supporting and uplifting them, and you have people like uh, Professor Jim Abwadi analyzing it all for us. So I think this should all give us more hope and it should certainly, um, well, before I do that, I wanna thank uh, Amy Whalen and Nora Smith uh, from CDDRL, uh, our great facility staff here at FSI. And most of all, please join me in thanking the 2022 FSI ST Lee lecturer, Professor Jim Abwadi. Thank you. Thanks.